um, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on which time zone you are in. First of all, thank you for joining us wherever you are in this conference or this uh, uh, forum. I'm Unjong Lee, Director of the Institute of Korean Studies and of the Graduate School of East Asian Studies at the Frau University of Berlin. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to our Human Security Forum of the, of our, of the Korea Europe Center. This center was established last year in cooperation between our Institute of Korean Studies at the Frau University of Berlin and the KDI School of Public Policy and Management in Korea. The world has changed a lot over the last year. For how many months, a lady, we have been uh, forced to stay home and to practice social distancing. I hope you will all be safe and healthy wherever you are. One positive aspect of this COVID-19 has been that uh, events like this one truly have become international events, would be our public events audiences coming from beyond Berlin all over the world. Virtual conferences across border have become the new normal due to the COVID-19. I am most delighted that Madame Mogherini will speak to us now. I would like to thank her for accepting the invitation and Teresa Novotina for organizing this event. And now I would like to introduce Professor Dean Patsikula, the president of the Freie Universität Berlin. For other obligations, President Sigler cannot be with us personally. We will now watch the video recording his son. Dear Mrs. Mogherini, ladies and gentlemen, dear Professor Lee, it is my great pleasure to welcome you today at the opening event of this year's Human Security and Development Forum at the Korea Europe Center at Freie Universität Berlin. Unfortunately, I'm not able to speak to you directly due to other commitments. I'm therefore all the more pleased to welcome you warmly via this video message. I hope that you feel that I'm with you in this way as well, as COVID times have taught us to make and maintain contact in digital formats. Freie Universität Berlin was founded in December 1948 by students and academics who wanted to have a chance and a space and a setting where they could freely pursue their learning and research activities without being subject to political pressures. Thus, Veritas, Justitia and Libertas, truth, justice and freedom, represent the university's values. These values, truth, justice and freedom, are still represented in the official seal and logo of our university, which was designed by the second rector of the university. And of course, we do carry Freiheit, freedom, in the name of the university, and we mean it. Freie Universität Berlin has had very strong and sustainable international support from the beginning. It has been a champion of multilateral international cooperation, and it has since maintained and strengthened its network of international relationships. It was successful as an international network university, and it is proud to continue and live and further develop this concept of the international network university as a title of its excellence. The Institute of Korean Studies was established in the winter semester of 2003-2004 in order to strengthen the connections of Freie Universität Berlin to the Korean Peninsula. In 2011, a strategic partnership network with Korea was established in order to intensify the partnership between Freie Universität Berlin and its Korean network universities, enabling an academic exchange and cooperation on various levels. The establishment of the Korea Europe Center 
a joint project of the Institute of Korean Studies and the KDI School of Public Policy and Management in the last year is the latest treasured addition to this network. Professor Lee, in her 12 years as the director of the Institute of Korean Studies, has built a strong network of academics and political decision makers from Korea, Germany and Europe to foster the exchange on the topics of reunification, peace and security research. With the Korea Europe Center, the Institute of Korean Studies strives to build a hub to bring together Korea experts from diverse fields and intensify the European-Korean cooperation. At Freie Universität, it was always of great importance for researchers not only to discuss among themselves, but to be part in a broad and multilateral dialogue about cooperation and trust, about ideas and measures that would make the world safer for everyone, more cooperative and more supportive. And on a global scale, of course, a lot will depend on the new Biden presidency and on the question of balance, influence, power and cooperation between the major powers and players, the United States, Europe, Russia and China. In Berlin, we are in a distinguished place to observe and to discuss this. And of course, also Korean voices, interests, hopes and perspectives depend on this. And the Korean situation is a central testing ground for international cooperation, if anything can be central on the globe. This forum is a great setting to observe and discuss international perspectives. Thus, we are very pleased and honored to welcome Federica Mogherini as today's speaker at the Korea Europe Center's 2021 Human Security and Development Forum. She is distinguished as Rector of the College of Europe and former High Representative of the European Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy and the former Vice President of the European Commission. And she will certainly empower us with a great wealth of observations, perspectives and perhaps recommendations. Mrs. Mogherini, I would like to express my sincere gratitude for your participation in this event. Although I am deeply sorry that I cannot be part of this in real time, I am sure that the whole audience today is very much looking forward to your talk on the future of transatlantic relations and the EU's role in Asia under the Biden presidency and the following discussion. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Professor Gigolo, for your warm remarks. Before I turn over the microphone to Teresa Nobutna, the moderator for today's event, let me briefly introduce the Human Security and Development Forum of the Korea Europe Center. To this forum, we regularly invite uh, politicians, journalists, and experts. Focusing on discussing current Korea-related policy issues in the domestic, regional, and global context during the nuclear issue, this forum aims to promote the international dialogue between Korea and Europe. Therefore, with this forum, we hope to contribute to peace building on the Korean Peninsula in East Asia. Now, let me turn the microphone over to you. First of all, thank you very much uh, to uh, Federica Mogherini for accepting our session. It is uh, my great honor and pleasure to welcome you, at least in this uh, uh, virtual world. Um, I'm sure that uh, you do not uh, need much introduction. Nevertheless, uh, I'll, I'll say a few words about your very distinguished career. Um, so, as Prof, uh, Professor Ziegler uh, mentioned, uh, you are currently a rector of College of Europe, which is a well-known university in Bruges, Belgium. Uh, and sort of a breeding ground for future uh, EU officials. Uh, you are also a co-chair of the UN panel on internal uh, displacement, uh, fellow at Harvard Kennedy School, and, and uh, also on board of various think tanks, including 
a German Marshall Fund, International Crisis Group, uh, uh, Institute for Foreign Affairs. In but as Professor Ziegler mentioned, um, you are probably best known uh, for your uh, uh, previous appointment as a day for Foreign Affairs uh, and Security Policy and Vice President of the European Commission from 14 to 2019. So, to you know, uh, so the very long title uh, uh, into you know one phrase, it would be sort of a, a EU Foreign Minister. Um, but before that, you were uh, you were also an Italian uh, foreign minister and member of the lower house of the Italian Parliament. And if I may make a very small uh, personal remark before I work in Asia and EU Korea relations, um, I did a lot of research about the role of high representative uh, and about the European External Action Service. And you know, I was doing things like um, counting how many. Uh, uh, how many uh, um, people you nominated as you ambassadors, how many times you attended the uh, College of Commissioner uh, meetings. So for me personally, it's also uh, great to, to have you here as my sort of research subject, if I may put it uh, this way. Uh, so thank you very much again for, uh, for being here. Uh, so as Professor Tsigla mentioned, uh, uh, Rector Mogherini will uh, talk for about 20, 30 minutes up to you uh, about uh, what the new presidency of the Biden-Harris team means for transatlantic relations, but also for the role of the EU in Asia and on the Korean Peninsula. Um, of course, um, as High Representative, if you experienced uh, not only two presidents, Obama, but also uh, you, you were in touch with uh, Brandon as Vice President Biden. So maybe we will learn also some uh, about him. And after the key my function, so just for uh, the, the uh, attendees, uh, here to the end, you should be able to find the bottom corner. So feel free to type questions there. And once we have a, a discussion, I will, I will collect the questions and uh, ask them. Uh, so, without much uh, further ado, uh, the the virtual the virtual floor is yours. First of all, let me thank you for the invitation uh, for this initiative, and for me, it is really a pleasure uh, to um, spend this uh, time with you uh, this morning uh, with uh, uh, the attendees that are um, joining us. Uh, uh, and I would like to uh, wish them all uh, not only good health, but uh, um, all the best in the difficult times, but also, uh, again, good evening or good morning or good afternoon, depending on what time zone you are in. For me, it's really a pleasure uh, because, uh, uh, well, first of all, um, uh, the topic uh, of our discussion this morning is extremely interesting, I think, for all of us and extremely timely. Uh, but also uh, because I have uh, uh, indeed uh, um, a special uh, connection uh, with uh, uh, the Korean Peninsula. I visited Korea many times. I've worked a lot with uh, Korean colleagues uh, in my different capacities. And I've always been very much convinced that uh, uh, not only Europe and uh, Korea have uh, a natural um, friendship uh, and uh, so many points of uh, uh, common views in terms of principles, values, uh, and uh, also share a lot of in common interests and i've always been convinced that uh, uh, europe uh, can have a very important role to play uh, not only on the nuclear issue uh, but also on uh, uh, regional dynamics uh, in uh, um, uh, in that part of asia i'll come to that in a moment uh, uh, as i might uh, zoom in from uh, the election of biden uh, and the uh, uh, new um, uh, administration in the United States to transatlantic relations, the role of Europe, and uh, uh, how this new transatlantic dynamic could uh, be relevant and could have an impact on uh, um, Asian affairs and, in particular, on Korean uh, affairs. Uh, but first of all, let me take this opportunity to um, to uh, um, somehow uh, welcome you through this connection, through this virtual connection uh, to Bruges, where I am currently. Uh, as uh, uh, you mentioned, I am now uh, since September, uh, so since the beginning of this academic year, rector at the College of Europe. For those of you that uh, um, don't know it, it's a postgraduate uh, institute specialized in European studies. Uh, we have uh, uh, one campus in Bruges, uh, one hour away from Brussels uh, with 350 students, and we have another campus in uh, 
uh, Warsaw in Poland um, with 150 students. And uh, we cover all different aspects of European affairs from the international relations and diplomatic action to uh, law studies, uh, economics and political science. We also have a transatlantic program uh, in cooperation with the Fletcher School in the United States. And um, I would be really interested in, as a rector, um, uh, looking into uh, further cooperation, not only with your institute and your university, but also to welcome future students uh, that might uh, uh, join our college in the coming years. Because I believe, even my background, I think it is natural that uh, the more diverse our student body is, uh, the more we will manage to uh, increase and improve the understanding of the European Union role inside Europe, but also in uh, international relations. And I'm seeing that uh, uh, not only European Union students, but also more and more um, students from all over the world, from Asia to Latin America, to North America or Africa, are coming to the college to understand the, um, the functioning of the European Union, the potential of the European Union from the inside. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to further cooperation also in this field. Um, having uh, closed this uh, small introduction of my current role, um, let me focus on the theme of today, on the issue of today. We just saw um, a few days ago the inauguration of uh, President Biden uh, with Vice President Harris, and we are seeing in these days uh, the hearings uh, in Congress uh, of uh, the team that will constitute the uh, backbone of the administration, of the new administration in the United States. Uh, and for sure, um, there is a shared uh, sense of uh, relief uh, across the world and for sure in Europe, but very much so also in large parts of the United States public opinion uh, about a change in uh, attitude, a change in policy uh, already uh, put in place with the first acts that the president has signed the very first day in office. Uh, and in general terms, I would say uh, of, a general, uh, of a completely different approach to international relations. Uh, I believe that the first element uh, that will be extremely important and relevant uh, for the rest of the world of this Biden administration will be uh, its capacity to um, change the domestic U.S. dynamics. Uh, you might have noticed even in the inauguration speech, uh, President Biden has focused a lot, if not exclusively, on domestic um, dynamics and on the need to reunite the United States, the society, and somehow to accept that this agreement uh, doesn't mean division. I think this, uh, um, this core mission uh, that the president uh, identifies for his mandate um, is uh, uh, also reflected in the diversity of his team. Uh, I think none of the previous administrations has been so diverse in uh, the background uh, of its members, um, if they are confirmed by, by the Congress after the hearings. And I believe this, um, this intention to heal the wounds of uh, uh, ethnic, um, uh, mainly ethnic divisions, uh, is uh, probably uh, something on which uh, uh, the new US administration will uh, not only focus a lot, but also somehow project outside of its borders. I think that uh, for sure in Europe, but also in other parts of the world, uh, this intention to accept and, uh, and uh, put into the right value um, uh, diversity of society reflected in the institutional setup uh, will be somehow of inspiration uh, for other countries and other parts of the world. So I would say that first, the first element uh, that uh, uh, will change uh, is uh, uh, the approach towards diversity, uh, respect, uh, and uh, a human rights-based approach, both domestically and internationally. And this might have uh, um, uh, somehow an inspirational effect on other societies and other decision makers uh, as well. For sure in Europe, uh, this will give a push to um, all those that are trying to um, overcome uh, some of or, or um, uh, clearly um, control and, and impede the development uh, of uh, uh, xenophobic uh, attitudes across uh, our societies uh, or extreme right movements uh, that are taking place in some parts of, uh, of the world. I think that this is going to be uh, in itself, even if with a very domestic angle, something that will have an impact also internationally. Uh, the promotion of human rights, um, diversity, and, um, uh, and uh, um, the empowerment of different sectors of society. Then obviously, uh, moving, uh, zooming out uh, from, from Washington and, and the United States at large, 
Um, you have seen probably the first telephone calls that the president has uh, has done. Um, for sure, the transatlantic relations will be strengthened. Um, he had a call yesterday uh, with the uh, Secretary General of NATO, Stoltenberg, uh, and then called Putin, uh, and I'll come to Russia in a moment. Uh, but I think uh, um, what will be uh, the, the compass um, for, for this administration would be beyond the domestic policy um, to uh, have an overall completely different approach to international relations. The Trump administration had a, a very transactional approach. I win, you lose. I cannot win if you don't lose. Uh, we make a deal. Uh, normally, it was two strong figures of men across the table, um, either fighting or shaking hands. Um, and uh, yes, the, the concept was uh, was a um, was a very transactional one. It was a zero sum game approach. Um, in, in the logic of uh, uh, trade deals or, or commercial deals that President Trump was used to, uh, to make in his previous uh, uh, life. Um, I believe that President Biden will uh, uh, move completely away from this kind of approach internationally, both with, with Europe, but also with others, and take a much more, in my opinion, pragmatic approach, uh, seeing uh, and realizing that the world is a complex place to be in these times. Uh, we have uh, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic, we have the economic and financial impact of it, uh, that I think we are just starting to see, uh, but it will develop its negative consequences probably for years, if not decades to come all over the world. You have tensions and conflicts that are uh, um, far from being solved all around the world. You have a nuclear proliferation and arms proliferation issue also in different parts of the world. You have the climate change challenge uh, to be addressed. So the world is, the, is a difficult place to be in this moment. And the only approach, I believe this is the narrative of the Biden administration very much shared with Europe, the only approach that can realistically uh, give some solutions or at least do damage control in this very difficult circumstances is to find common ground with as many allies and partners as possible. So I believe that uh, the Biden administration will uh, uh, look for um, partnerships and cooperation uh, with, first of all, the natural allies, Europeans, uh, but also some of the Asian uh, or American uh, natural allies, and I'm sure Korea is one of those, um, in a multilateral approach. So reinvesting in the UN system and agencies, you have seen already the rejoining uh, of, uh, um, uh, of the um, Paris uh, Climate Agreements, uh, but also of the uh, World Health Organization. So the signal is clear, uh, the United States are ready to re-engage together with others. I believe that this will, not, um, this will not mean that the United States will be ready to take the lead on everything or on uh, all the different files that are on, open on the table, but I believe that they will uh, systematically look for partnerships and cooperations with different players on different topics, so to work together, not necessarily in the lead, but always together with others. Uh, the message America is back uh, doesn't necessarily mean America is back to lead everywhere, but it means America is back to work with partners to find sustainable, pragmatic, practical solutions, principled solutions. Because another element that uh, I believe uh, will be extremely strong and extremely different from the past, uh, at least from the past four years, uh, will be the attention to values and principles, human rights based foreign policy. Um, you might uh, remember uh, at a certain moment of the Trump presidency, the at the time Secretary of State, I believe it was Tillerson, um, made a, a public statement saying that uh, the US foreign policy from that moment onwards was not based on human rights principles anymore, but was somehow detached from that, becoming more pragmatic. Uh, that was a moment of, uh, uh, I would say, sadness uh, and also loneliness for many people around the world, uh, and for sure for Europeans, uh, but I'm sure also for Koreans. Uh, because uh, a human rights uh, based foreign policy means also the consistency uh, to support civil society, human rights activists, and to uh, make sure that uh, um, your um, interests, including your economic or commercial interests, uh, are not for sale, uh, are not, uh, uh, are not uh, at the disposal of any kind of trade deal. Um, 
and that you are, uh, as one of the leaders of, of the world, um, committed to, uh, to promoting uh, values um, that are coherent with your own uh, national ones. So I believe that uh, uh, this all framework uh, uh, will give uh, uh, Europeans, but also others in the world, I think of uh, um, liberal democracies around the world, I think of for sure Korea, Canada, Australia, others, um, across the world, um, an interlocutor. Uh, you might remember uh, there was a famous uh, sentence that Kissinger um, said um, many years ago, uh, complaining that he didn't uh, know what was the telephone number of Europe. Now, in these last years, uh, with the Trump administration, we have seen that uh, the telephone number of the European Union, at least, was very clear. Uh, everybody had it. That there's a president of the European Commission, that the president of the European Council, there's a high representative, that is the international telephone number to call. Uh, but the problem we had during these last four years was that the telephone number of Washington was not so clear. Um, there were different, different telephone numbers, um, people responding or not responding to the calls, uh, many times not responding to the calls of all allies, not only of Europeans. And even when they were responding, um, the answer you got uh, could be could have could have been very different uh, from one hour to the other, or depending on which interlocutor was picking up the phone. So there was really a sense of uh, um, of lack of interlocutor on the other side uh, of the Atlantic. For sure, this will change now. This has changed already. Um, and I believe that uh, this will help the, um, uh, the transatlantic community to redefine a common agenda for international and transatlantic cooperation. Or let me put it this way, for an international cooperation, a multilateral cooperation that is based on a transatlantic agenda. Uh, I believe that there will be several priorities through which uh, the new administration will look. Uh, we can uh, uh, maybe go more into uh, this uh, uh, in uh, in the Q and A uh, session. Uh, my impression is that uh, um, first of all, it will take a little bit of time uh, for the administration to look into the files seriously, because differently from any other time, uh, there has been no transition real period. Um, the, the dossier, the files have not been shared before, uh, and so I guess that the new administration will very practically need to have some weeks to look into the files and do the transition after they come in rather than before, which is not so functional, but uh, it will be needed, um, which means that we might not have immediate action on some files, but some decisions coming more in, in the coming weeks and months. And I think uh, there will be uh, a close look at some um, priority areas. Um, I would uh, guess that one priority area would be for sure NATO, uh, where um, there has been uh, uh, tension and suffering, I would say, uh, during the last four years, uh, not having a clear uh, indication uh, from Washington of what kind of, what level, what degree of engagement and commitment uh, was there on, on the US side to the military alliance in a delicate moment, uh, because as you know, um, NATO is in uh, the process of reshaping uh, its uh, uh, core mission, including, for instance, uh, um, climate change among the security threats, which is something relevant for a military alliance like that one, uh, but also a delicate moment when you look at Afghanistan and the withdrawal of troops from the United States. So I think that that will be one of the main priorities, also because I think the US administration will look at files on the foreign policy side that will be as much as possible consensual in Congress uh, in the attempt to bring together the different parties uh, and uh, and heal the wounds of divisions of the last years. And for NATO for sure is one of the most consensual ones across the, uh, the political landscape in the United States. Then I think there will be uh, a focus, a strong focus on uh, uh, relations with uh, uh, and, and together with the NATO investment, I think will come a natural reinvestment with the European Union and with the European allies. But not only as Trump sometimes did with bilateral relations with the European uh, allies, but uh, with the European Union as such. Because this is, I think, one of the fundamental differences between the two administrations. Uh, we have some, well, the one that just uh, finished and, and the one that is starting now is that for Trump, the European Union was in itself 
um, uh, a problematic uh, entity because it was it is uh, the uh, clear living example that multilateralism works uh, being the European Union the most advanced multilateral experiment in the world uh, and as such it was very disturbing for Trump I believe and so he always uh, tried to overcome relations with the European Union and go for the bilateral angle uh, with the different European Union member states sometimes uh, even with success some other times not so much so I think that Biden will reinvest not only in NATO and in military alliance but also in relations with the European Union as such um, then I think that the main focus will be China uh, how to uh, how to what extent uh, to readjust uh, the narrative and the relations uh, the messaging uh, that he self and, and his administration is giving uh, at the moment is one of continuity but i believe that in reality uh, there will be some adjustments uh, on the basis of uh, a principled but pragmatic approach and i believe that also in relations with china um, it will be um, uh, it will be useful and, and valuable uh, for the biden administration to uh, coordinate with the european union because uh, uh, mainly from the trade perspective, uh, there are interests that are shared across the Atlantic vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the China policy. Uh, in the European Union, we, uh, I think we suffered a lot uh, when uh, uh, we realized that uh, um, in the most difficult times of discussions with the Chinese authorities, I think, for instance, of the issue of reproduction uh, and still um, in the moment when we were negotiating in a difficult manner with China, um, the United States were at the same time having a step back and, and leaving Europe alone. Um, I believe that uh, uh, there will be um, exchanges between uh, the two sides of the Atlantic on how to balance relations with China. Um, and Europe can have something to share here because, uh, as you know, uh, Europe, the European Union has developed a multi-layered approach to China, recognizing partnership on some issues, but also um, even uh, um, uh, rivalry uh, on uh, on some others uh, and disagreement on clear terms on some other issues. Uh, think of uh, uh, human rights uh, issues or some uh, other elements. So I think that will be the second file uh, to be looked at. Russia, uh, I believe that also here the United States and Europe will go hand in hand uh, from uh, uh, um, the democratic um, basic principles to be observed inside the country uh, to the um, no proliferation agreements. Uh, I believe that the Biden administration will invest a lot uh, in preserving what is left of the previous non proliferation architecture uh, and try to um, invest in, in renewing some elements and some chapters that uh, were either dismantled before in this last four years or seriously damaged. I'll come to that uh, uh, in a moment. Uh, but also um, different uh, areas of conflict, uh, think of Ukraine, I think of Afghanistan itself or the Middle East or Syria. So I think that uh, uh, also on that there will be close cooperation. Um, and then, as I mentioned, uh, uh, the non-proliferation file, uh, and as I don't want to take too much time, let me finish by saying that I believe that um, uh, this administration will refocus on the, um, on the nuclear, nuclear non-proliferation file uh, in a way that uh, uh, will be completely new uh, compared to the past. Uh, you know that uh, the Trump administration had uh, uh, two different attitudes uh, on the two biggest nuclear non-proliferation files that are open in the world today. Um, he, he tried to dismantle, dismantle the Iran nuclear deal, um, which is, I would say, still alive, uh, even if not in good uh, shape. And I believe that uh, the, Trump, the, the, the damages that were done during the Trump administration time uh, are still possible to be fixed. Uh, by the new administration if uh, there are actions that uh, are taken in this next um, few months. There are elections in Iran coming up in uh, uh, June. Um, there might be a change in uh, political leadership. 
less inclined to cooperation uh, on an international level after the elections. So I believe that uh, um, the, uh, in particular, the State Department, um, if uh, Wendy Sherman uh, will be confirmed after the hearings as uh, uh, the Deputy uh, Secretary of State, uh, well, she has been uh, together with me uh, one of the key players in uh, uh, defining and, and uh, uh, working and negotiating the Iran uh, uh, nuclear uh, deal. Uh, so she knows for sure not only all the details, but also the interlocutors and the dynamics around it. And this, I think, uh, um, will uh, um, will uh, constitute a very good basis for uh, the U.S. administration to look into how to revitalize this agreement and how to re-enter the agreement somehow from the United States side uh, with the right timing and with the right proceedings. And I think that the, the, a similar um, a similar guess might, might be done uh, regarding the approach that this administration will take. Uh, on the um, on the uh, Korean uh, nuclear uh, proliferation uh, non proliferation file, uh, the Trump administration took a very peculiar approach. Um, I visited uh, uh, Korea several times, uh, uh, including during the um, uh, Trump administration uh, period, um, ha having um, high level talks with uh, uh, our Korean interlocutors uh, and visits on the ground. And I've always had the impression that. Uh, uh, the Trump method was always that of jumping over the heads of those directly involved, if I can use a very undiplomatic expression, and trying to reach an agreement on one single person on the other side. Uh, it's the approach they've had with the Taliban on Afghanistan, um, sidelining uh, the, um, the legitimate government. I have had the impression sometimes that it was also the approach that the Trump administration took towards uh, uh, his talks with, uh, uh, with North Korea, uh, not necessarily always um, giving to these talks the right regional uh, or even international multilateral framework. Uh, and in the absence of a regional multilateral framework, um, any talk uh, is uh, exposed to the change of mood of one of the leaders. Uh, which is extremely dangerous to have in a moment uh, of uh, discussion of nuclear issues, uh, as you can imagine. So the safety net of a multilateral uh, framework, I think, will be uh, something that the new administration will uh, look at, including uh, the need to work first and foremost with the partner, which in this case is the Republic of Korea, and then taking it from there and maybe probably enlarging uh, the um, the framework to other international players, uh, other regional partners that can help accompany the process, either with their expertise on nuclear issues or on sanctions related issues, including or starting from the European Union. I believe that the European Union can play a very significant role in that respect because it has had uh, a lot of experience in uh, in negotiating uh, nuclear non-proliferation agreements, which require a very high and sophisticated level of technical knowledge of both nuclear issues and sanctions related issues, uh, not to mention the, um, the need to carefully um, choreography uh, of, uh, of uh, international multilateral uh, negotiations that need to be taken into consideration. So I believe that uh, for sure it will not be priority number one, um, but I think it will be on the agenda. Uh, as I mentioned, the indication of Wendy Sherman uh, is also a signal having she worked on uh, on the Korean file for long uh, is an indication of the fact that for sure this this administration will look at the non-proliferation issue uh, seriously. Uh, maybe not maybe not so much with the uh, with a visibility uh, approach. Uh, I wouldn't expect big uh, uh, visits or shows or you know headlines, but more with a consistent, solid uh, uh, background uh, work uh, built uh, than to hopefully find some solutions. And I think that in general terms, uh, um, looking at, uh, um, at uh, um, uh, Northeast Asia, I believe that uh, this administration will uh, work closely uh, with uh, partners and allies uh, to, to build some form of regional uh, cooperation network. Uh, there is so much needed and so much missing uh, in that part of the world. But this is another story. Um, I think I've been speaking even too long, so I will probably finish uh, here and uh, very much looking forward to uh, questions, comments also 
uh, because I, I know that uh, our audience today is a very qualified one. So I would be very much interested not only in getting questions, but also in uh, hearing comments and observations uh, and contributions from uh, our attendees. So again, let me thank you for your attention, for the invitation and looking forward to our discussion and then obviously also to further cooperation in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mogherini, for a really uh, nice uh, discussion of uh, the, what we can expect uh, when actually the Biden administration gets gets to work, and it's really good to, to hear sort of your positive uh, positive expectations, and also touching on um, uh, issues from not just transatlantic relationship and NATO, but also on China, Russia, and of course on the Korean Peninsula, which is especially um, important for uh, our institute. Um, for uh, for all the participants, I will just remind that you can ask questions uh, through the Q and A uh, button, which should be at the uh, at your uh, bottom right corner um, of your screen. And uh, I will combine the questions which I will see there with uh, with some questions that that I uh, that I prepared. Um, so uh, m maybe first, uh, since you are talking about uh, the transatlantic relationship um, that um, the Biden administration will probably want to reach uh, reach to allies uh, much more than uh, reach out to allies much more than the previous administration did, and also that the EU will be um, will be one of the key partners. And yet, as uh, we have one question from the audience uh, uh, the first uh, calls uh, from the US from Washington were to Prime Minister Johnson and President Macron and also yesterday to uh, Chancellor Merkel uh, but there was no um, there was no, no communication as far as I know between the EU level um, either um, President Michel or President von der Leyen um, or high representative Borrell with uh, with the US. I mean, there could have been some uh, possibly um, um, indirect uh, context, but uh, you know, the official phone call, so to speak. So, do you think that this is actually a you know not such a positive sign as as we would uh, as we would think, or how do you think that this sort of EU versus EU member state uh, relationship with with the uh, Biden administration may develop? Uh, I wouldn't be too worried about that. Um, this is the typical thing that, uh, on which, uh, if you are a EU official, uh, you definitely worry about, uh, because uh, this is the kind of question you might get for sure in the European Parliament or in, in the media. Uh, why hasn't there been, um, among the very first calls, uh, uh, one with, uh, with the European Union uh, top officials? Uh, well, for Borrell, I can say that the level would not be that of the president, would be that of the Secretary of State, and I'm sure 100% that Tony Blinken will uh, have as one of the first calls um, a phone call with the European Union because he knows uh, the European Union well, he's been uh, um, working a lot on this uh, before, so again, I, I wouldn't doubt about that. Um, and. Um, the symbolism of first calls for sure is important, uh, but again, I have the impression that this administration uh, will look more at the substance of work than at the symbolism of gestures, uh, because that th that is my impression. Also, from hearing the uh, inaugural speech, the inauguration speech, uh, I've noticed uh, a less rhetoric uh, and and more, um, I would say, uh, down to earth approach. Uh, as if the president knew, as I think knows, that uh, what is needed is hard work, much more than uh, nice to have uh, gestures. And this was also the feeling I got when I saw that uh, the reports about his telephone call with Putin uh, yesterday. Uh, the fact that um, he called him as uh, one of the first ones uh, to be called to discuss already, um, for instance, the START Treaty. Um, it, it's an indication of the fact that the president is already at work. Uh, these are not uh, symbolic calls. These are calls to discuss already content of action uh, to be taken. 
so it, it's not the first also because it's a president that has experience already uh, so he doesn't know it doesn't need some some uh, 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 time to get into the job he knows the job already and uh, um, and his uh, the signal I, I think also in his conversation with with uh, secretary general stoltenberg uh, is already on the files that are on the table. It's not uh, uh, an introductory uh, call. So I think that uh, um, I have no doubt that contacts with the European Union at the highest level will be taken immediately. Contacts with uh, um, with member states, uh, I, I don't see them as problematic at all. Uh, this has always also been my approach when I was in office, uh, um, but maybe because I was coming from uh, uh, an institutional role in one of the member states, uh, it's easier for me to see it as a complementary and not a contradictory uh, element. I believe that the more uh, member states are involved in uh, the European Union um, external action at large sense, the better it is for the European Union as such, because the European Union without the member states doesn't exist. Uh, so the member states are the ones that are um, coordinating and driving together uh, the external action of the European Union. This is recognized by the treaties, and this is also what happened in, in practice. So um, I, I would take it as a, as a positive thing, the fact that President Biden has reached out to some European leaders um, without too much of, uh, of an institutional or interinstitutional jealousy at this stage. The important thing is that the United States now are back to recognizing that um, that Europe is a number one um, partner and ally, and not a, a challenge or or a threat, even for the United States, as it was the case during the previous administration. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, hopefully, President Biden may also accept the invitation to one of the uh, summits of uh, the EU leaders. Uh, let's see. Um, maybe I'll uh, ask now a question uh, which is related to another issue that is uh, quite high on the agenda and that's relationship with China. Um, because, um, I mean, especially in the, uh, the last year or so, we've definitely seen a, uh, quite a bit of deterioration of situation when it comes to Hong Kong, Xinjiang, but there are also issues closer to home. You know, we can just think about the uh, quite an aggressive mass diplomacy and the sort of wolf warrior diplomat rhetorics, all, all sorts of arbitrary detentions or even suspicions of, uh, you know, spying activities, including um, former employees of the EAS. But on the other hand, you know, we shouldn't we shouldn't be become too paranoid about uh, these kind of issues. And as you rightly said, um uh, we we will need to uh, collaborate with china on uh, all sorts of issues from climate change to possibly even north korea um and of course if if you are realistic when it comes to economic recovery we need, we need a trade ship with china which is probably the outcome of that thinking is probably the uh, uh lastly uh, the the investment treaty with china which has been concluded in December 2020, which has been sort of seen a bit uh, in controversial terms. So here's my question just uh, outside of the, the, the broader um, perspective is, why do you think that the relationship with China between the EU and China has been deteriorating quite quickly uh, because of the issues that I mentioned? Uh, I would say, especially since uh, since the, the the new commission uh, that has taken uh, uh, the office, do you think it's just because of the relationship with the U.S. under Trump that may change Biden, or these underlying causes for that? How should, of course, Europe react as a uh, you know as a partner vis-à-vis -vis U.S. vis-à-vis -vis China, but also more from the um, level of, of uh, people like us, uh, academics, uh, civil society uh, members, how can we now engage with the Chinese academics, Chinese uh, civil society, if you can, uh, you know, co consider it a civil society, so that we are not uh, accused of, say, being collaborators with the Chinese uh, regime. Um, so how, how do you see, see this broader relationship? Um, um to to you know to move forward so i think that 
Yes, I think the relations with China uh, seen from the European perspective uh, have been probably one of the most complex uh, ones in, in the last uh, years. Um, and this is why I believe that it would be extremely uh, useful uh, to have an early conversation uh, across the Atlantic on how uh, to coordinate or at least to exchange notes uh, on uh, uh, across the Atlantic on how to um, approach China and how to establish, uh, um, I would say, a correct um, partnership with China. I talk about partnership because there are some issues on which partnership is indeed in place. Uh, the European approach has been in these years uh, that of having a very clear uh, and transparent approach with China on the basis of uh, uh, different uh, levels, I would say. Uh, some issues on which uh, partnership and cooperation with China was uh, and is uh, not only uh, looked for, but also practiced. Uh, I mentioned the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, China has played a key role, not only in uh, getting to the deal, but also in implementing the deal and preserving the deal uh, when the US were stepping out. Uh, we, the same can be said about uh, uh, the climate uh, change uh, agreement uh, that was reached in Paris. Um, without a commitment and partnership with China, uh, we all know that there's no effective climate action possible in the world. So cooperation and partnership is needed, but also on some other files, um, being them uh, uh, of global nature, um, UN related, uh, but even uh, in, in, some, uh, uh, in some conflict areas, being China, uh, a, a permanent member of the uh, Security Council, so with a veto power, on purely foreign policy issues, cooperation with China is, in many cases, desirable and, uh, in any case, needed uh, from, from a realistic perspective. So, uh, there is a level of partnership and cooperation with China that is true and that is, uh, um, and that is positive. Uh, then there is also uh, an element of uh, a field uh, of uh, uh, contrast. Uh, and I think that the European Union has managed in these years to clarify which are the elements of this divergence, human rights, the uh, level of field on uh, trade and investments, um, some security issues related to 5G, for instance, uh, but not only. Uh, and I would say, and some also on the international issues on which for sure um, divergences exist. Uh, but I think that this, this exercise that the Europeans have, have done and the Americans have not done in these years um, of, of distinguishing which are the fields where cooperation is desirable, possible and actually is taking place and others on which problems are clearly and transparently spelled out and addressed, um, I think has been a healthy uh, process. Uh, a very difficult one, very difficult one, but a healthy process that has allowed some forms of cooperation on some of the key files to actually happen. Mm -hmm. And again, China is not an irrelevant player in the world of today. And I think that the United States will most likely go through a similar exercise of identifying some fields, some sectors on which cooperation with China might be desirable and needed. And again, as I mentioned on the on the um, on the proliferation uh, file, uh, the first messages of Biden towards Putin even uh, have been that of let's try to find a solution to to, to prolong uh, the treaty in place. Which means even if we strongly disagree on human rights, respect, democracy uh, principles in your country or Ukraine, there are some other files on which cooperation between us is needed and needs to be preserved to keep the world safer than otherwise. And I think this is going to be the same approach that I guess uh, the United States would take towards uh, China. Uh, from what concerns our side, um, how, to, uh, how to keep links uh, or develop links with civil society or academia uh, in China um, uh, without being dragged into um, an institutional um, cooperation that uh, uh, would not be a comfortable place to be. Um, well, first of all, uh, very difficult to have um, anything with China that is not institutional framed, uh, because in China everything becomes institutional. Uh, and this is, the, this is the point, including academia. Um, and, and this is something different from, from our uh, side. But on the other side, and I think we have to be very... Um, 
aware of this, uh, of the implications of content. Um, but on the other side, I believe that we have an interest in developing uh, connections uh, with the China's uh, uh, academic world, uh, first of all, for the um, quality of our work. Uh, I think that uh, uh, cooperation in the academic field is, is always a value, um, as long as it is uh, happening on the basis of transparency and uh, a merit-based, uh, content-based approach. Um, but also because I believe that it is extremely healthy uh, for uh, Chinese students and researchers uh, and academic professionals to have contacts with the outside world. Uh, I believe that uh, there is an added value, a pedagogical added value, I would say, uh, in developing these relations. In, uh, in the College of Europe, we have some Chinese students uh, that are uh, coming to study the European Union from inside. We know very well that uh, most likely uh, their interest is to study the European Union from the inside so that afterwards they can negotiate better <laughs> with the European Union once they will be in the Chinese institutions. But this is okay. I think that the important thing is to know what is the background, uh, to be aware, not to be naive about anything. But uh, again, I, I, I start with, with this example from our side. Um, personally, when I was a high representative, I always preferred to have on the other side of the table during a negotiation, even the difficult negotiation, an interlocutor that knew the European Union and its functioning rather than not, because this facilitates a lot uh, the negotiations. Uh, obviously, it gives also some power to the other side, because uh, the more you know your, your interlocutor, uh, the the more instruments you have also to use some some uh, uh, some issues uh, but uh, i always found that uh, negotiating with an interlocutor or third party that doesn't know you well uh, is more problematic because the risk of misunderstandings uh, and uh, um, and uh, um, misinterpretations uh, is too high and too risky so i think that uh, the more we connect with the chinese academy uh, academia the better it is um, for the Chinese civil society, um, but also for our institutional relations. And obviously, again, being as clear and as blunt and transparent as possible uh, on our points of uh, disagreement, starting with human rights. Uh, whenever I was visiting China uh, in my previous capacity, I was always meeting civil society representatives, uh, paying attention to protect their safety, uh, but uh, I never skipped once uh, a meeting with civil society representatives, and this was accepted. This was known, obviously, because everything is known there, uh, but this was uh, accepted and recognized as a priority for the European Union. Thank you. Thank you also for this encouragement, because in a way, also for people who work more on the Korean Peninsula, and I have tried to have contacts with the North Korea inside. This is also always a question, you know, how to engage also at sort of not just the political level, but more, more um, you know, uh, society to society level. And you know that, of course, on the the other side, everyone is somehow, which probably requests really very much to um, try some options which we have uh, from the apartments. Um, so, and you, yours, you focus quite a bit on, on, on Korean uh, Peninsula issues. Of course, you were in 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 in, in the uh, role of the high representative during the the, the period from say fire and fury to the peace Olympics on all the all the summits. Uh, you mentioned all your trips to South Korea, but uh, you also had contacts with actually North Korean F officials, if I remember correctly. Uh, one at the ASEAN Regional Forum uh, in Singapore in August 2018, where I think at that time it was uh, just you and the Chinese counterparts who actually had a chance to talk to the uh, uh, North Korean uh, uh, Foreign Minister Lee Jung Ho at the time. Um, and so even from, as you suggested, even from the European perspective, that period looked um, uh, quite positive. Um, yet at the same time, um, all those, the summits uh, between President Trump and Kim Jong-un didn't sort of uh, 
yield much of an outcome when it comes to solving the issue on the Korean Peninsula. So, what do you think? Um, you know how 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 the Biden administration, but also how Europe should now approach uh, the DPRK uh, situation. Also, because nowadays the DPRK is basically cut off from the outside world on its own will because of the uh, uh, COVID-19. Uh, but at the same time, there are still uh, sanctions in place. Um, one of the um, uh, participants is asking about the merits of those sanctions. Um, so how, you know, what would you say that would be the best new approach uh, uh, to take now, not just from the Biden administration, but also from Europe? Uh, and also, you know, if if the Europe wants to be at the table, it should also have a say. Or if we are asked to pay to foot the bill in, in the future, if there is some kind of a, um, agreement, we should definitely be at the table. But how how to achieve all of this? So sorry, it's a, quite a big question. But you know, from your experience. Um, you know, what, what would be now the best approach uh, to take? Uh, and also, of course, let's hope that there's not going to be any, uh, you know, big provocation anytime soon. Yes, um, this is the question, I think, uh, for for a conversation like ours, uh, indeed. And um, I might take a little bit of time to answer that. Uh, indeed, I had uh, um, the possibility to discuss uh, uh, this issue at length, uh, first of all, uh, with uh, um, with uh, our friends of the Republic of Korea. Uh, that was the starting point for the European Union always. Uh, and uh, um, we um, always, uh, uh, first of all, we had a, a great ambassador there and uh, uh, direct contacts uh, between myself and the foreign minister, but also um, the uh, the prime minister and the president. And uh, there, was, uh, also, there were also contacts with uh, uh, the DPRK officials uh, at different levels, including at my level with the minister, as you mentioned, during one of the ASEAN summits. Um, in that case, it was Singapore. Um, there, were, there, were, there was a meeting, uh, but also there were uh, other occasional informal um, short exchanges for a, a simple, um, very basic reason that sometimes uh, uh, do have uh, an impact on uh, uh, the practicalities of diplomacy. And that is that DPRK and the European Union were uh, always sitting next to each other for alphabetical order reasons. Uh, and so that gave uh, from time to time us the opportunity to uh, exchange a few words uh, um, at, at the margins of, uh, of the plenary sessions. Um, Sometimes diplomatic action is also uh, affected or uh, for good or for bad by, by very simple and, and basic uh, elements like uh, logistical ones. Uh, but I had that exchange, yes, and uh, our officials uh, uh, at different levels, as I mentioned, uh, had constantly an open channel with the DPRK. Um, mainly requested or at least encouraged uh, by uh, the DPRK itself, uh, but also um, on which we've always informed uh, um, the, uh, the Republic of Korea and uh, um, discussed this with them. Um, and the stages were different. What role for the European Union uh, at the table and afterwards uh, or before, and what uh, could be the, the envisaged uh, new approach? Uh, if I had the solution for an envisaged new approach, uh, I, I would probably um, um, have, uh, have managed to solve uh, uh, that uh, um, before. But I, for sure, uh, I have a very clear uh, thing in mind uh, that this is not a file that can be resolved bilaterally between Washington and Pyongyang. Uh, my uh, deep conviction is that it requires two. It requires for sure engagement from Washington, that is clear, because in the mind of the leadership in, in DPRK, the conflict is not within the Korean Peninsula, but it's between Pyongyang and Washington. That is their starting point, their mindset starting point. So for sure there is a need, a wrong one obviously, but uh, uh, you have to consider perspective, perception in, uh, in negotiations. Uh, so for sure an engagement from Washington is needed. Uh, but is not sufficient. Uh, I think that there are two other elements that are uh, key. 
um, to advance uh, some significant and sustainable uh, negotiations and results. Um, first, um, ownership and leadership in the Korean Peninsula, in, the, in Seoul. Um, I think Seoul has to be in the driving seat um, and uh, uh, has the knowledge and the understanding to be in the driving seat uh, and, and needs to, uh, to be recognized that knowledge and, and, uh, um, and uh, um, uh, wisdom and insight uh, on, the, on the Korean Peninsula issue. And then it requires, uh, uh, I, I would call it a safety net, a regional and international framework because uh, uh, the unpredictability of a, a negotiation like that is so high that if you don't have a safety net of international and regional players around the main elements of the negotiations, any incident uh, can make the entire process derail. If you don't set up a, a safety net of different players that can come in to adjust the course of the negotiations when you hit the wall, and you hit the wall in a negotiation like that uh, from time to time, you need to have different players uh, either preparing the files and the ground on different files. It can be, again, incentives, it can be economic incentives, it can be recognition, it can be nuclear related issues, it can be sanctions related issues, it can be regional cooperation. You can put together a lot of different frameworks. Uh, but if you don't set up an international multilateral framework, regional framework, uh, that can accompany the main negotiating table, uh, you expose the negotiations to too much risk uh, of, uh, of inconsistency, uh, which is exactly what happened. Um, when things were good, they seemed excellent and they seemed to uh, lead to an agreement uh, in 24 hours. And then 24 hours later, there was nothing anymore. This is not a serious, consistent way of leading negotiations. You need, especially in a complex issue like that, and especially with a complex country, um, and a complex regional framework uh, where history uh, has a lot of, uh, of weight um, and, and painful histories also on a personal level. Um, I mean, it, it's a, well, in, in Germany, you know something about reunification. Uh, it, it's, not, uh, it's not a walk in the garden. It, it's, it, it involves individuals and family histories and economic issues and perceptions. And if you, can, if you picture um, again, I know that parallelism is never correct and uh, history is different completely, but uh, if, if you imagine, if you measure the distance that was there between West Germany and East Germany uh, before the unification, and you measure the distance between Seoul and Pyongyang today, you realize the challenge that is in front of you. So there is the unification issue and there is the nuclear issue. These are the two, two different patterns, two different fights. But again, um, this, this might lead us to, to other discussions. But to say that the complexity of elements around this is so high and so deep and so emotional and so dangerous, uh, because you mentioned the risk of further provocations, that is real. Uh, that again, I believe that for sure, uh, the kind of setup would require strong involvement, ownership, and leadership from Seoul, strong engagement from Washington. And again, now, if Wendy Sherman is confirmed, I think that she would have uh, possibly uh, an important role in that. And then uh, a set of other players that can support and accompany the main negotiation. I don't think the European Union will have anything to ask because Already in, during my years, uh, it was uh, actually the European Union was asked to support uh, the negotiations or to come in with some knowledge or some measures, but not from Washington. Uh, paradoxically, from Pyongyang and Seoul, much more than from Washington, uh, or from the regional players, uh, in, uh, different actors, in, uh, including China, I think, might find it interesting to have the European Union as, again, not as a main negotiator, but as an accompanying power. Um, and I think the European Union would have uh, a lot of interest in doing that, first of all, because it's in our DNA to try and mediate and facilitate peace uh, and uh, uh, non-proliferation solutions across the world. We always benefit from that, uh, from a stability point of view, also from an economic point of view. Uh, the more the world is at peace, the more business we make. This is, I think, a German, a German teaching that we've learned all, um, that making business is much more convenient than making war. Uh, we finally got there and we try to project this uh, knowledge we have developed 
along our history to the rest of the world. So I think European Europeans will have an interest in, in accompanying or supporting a process like this, would have the knowledge to do this. And also I think that uh, our role would now be uh, recognized and also encouraged by, by others. And Sorry, just, I just uh, too much time on this. Yeah, just, just a quick additional question. Do you think also the um, EU member states will actually be willing to come up with uh, one single view what to do about North Korea? Because if you look at the positions of France and the UK, previously when it was still an EU member, but nowadays even Germany is sort of quite a hard line, if I can put it this way. On the other uh, hand, you have Sweden, Finland, which have always been very much pro engagement and sort of in the middle you have uh, countries like my homeland which is the uh, Czech Republic um, so do you think actually the EU member states would like to and would be capable of coming up you know with some kind of single uh, North Korea policy I have no doubt yes I have no doubt uh, at the end of the day, uh, you, you, this is a uh, this is a process that is always taking time and uh, a lot of energy and a lot of thinking. Um, but uh, what I have seen, what I have experienced, um, contrary to what uh, it appears sometimes, because uh, uh, what uh, hits the news is always the negative outcomes, is never the, the positive news that come out on the headlines. But contrary to to the general perception. If you look at the substance of the European foreign policy, you actually see much more unity than not. Uh, I see a lot of divisions inside the European Union on internal issues. You take the economic issues, you take the reaction to the financial crisis, for instance, you take the migration file. On, on domestic uh, European Union uh, internal issues, um, there are indeed divisions that are very difficult to bridge, if not sometimes impossible to bridge. Uh, but on the external action, on, on the foreign policy file, I have to say that you have you have different approaches, different attitudes, and even different analysis of the situations country to country. And sometimes it's rooted in history uh, or tradition. Uh, the countries you mentioned, the ones that are more uh, on engagement uh, or the middle ground, either have had historical, um, let's say, legacies, uh, given uh, the uh, um, the, the yes the, the previous history of these countries or have a, a strong humanitarian approach and obviously uh, if your foreign policy is very much rooted into the into the humanitarian uh, approach uh, engagement comes naturally because uh, uh, no matter where in the world you try to open bridges and, and doors to make sure that the population is better off than not and so you you, you try the engagement angle all the time uh, so you might have different approaches, different views. You have some member states that have an embassy uh, or a, present, a diplomatic presence in Pyongyang and some others not. You have a difference there of backgrounds, of approaches, but having a different background doesn't mean that you cannot have a common policy. To me, this has been always a richness and not a, a, not a limit. To, to, you, to be able to uh, use and, and put together different backgrounds, different knowledges, different approaches, different contacts uh, of member states can help you getting to a common position uh, on what to do. Uh, this has been possible always, including on uh, what seemed to be in 2014, so before my time uh, at the European Union, um, it seemed to be almost impossible to find a common uh, position on Ukraine, and yet it was done and uh, and was kept over time. Uh, so I think that again, having different viewpoints doesn't necessarily prevent the European Union member states to come up with a common policy for agreeing on uh, um, on uh, uh, on sort of action plan on what to do. Uh, then you can still differ on the tone, uh, but this is this can be even useful because you can can play different roles, uh, which is something that if you have only one voice, I, I never liked the expression speaking with one voice because I thought it was a, a diminution of what we could do. We need all the several voices we have, uh, but uh, singing the same song. Uh, and then you have the different tones, you have the different capacities, you have the different uh, uh, interlocutors um, towards which you can use one member state or another. Um, to me, this is richness is not uh, is not uh, a problem. 
So I'm confident that the European Union member states can define a common policy for sure. And I think they already have a common policy on, on DPRK, but obviously in a different phase, if negotiations start on a serious basis, that would be definitely needed. On Iran, there was never an issue. Even if, yeah, Iran is a perfect example. On uh, on uh, on Iran, the nuclear the, on the nuclear issues, but also in general on Iran policy, the European Union member states were always completely united, even when they were pressured from Washington bilaterally to uh, dismiss uh, their uh, um, their um, um, their um, participation in the uh, or implementation in the nuclear deal. Uh, and they stayed united all the time, even if uh, the narrative and also the bilateral relations were extremely dif different uh, from uh, uh, from different backgrounds and perspectives. So I'm 100% sure that this would be a, uh, a possibility without major problems. A lot of work, but not with major problems. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I'm very very happy for your optimism because this is also uh, you know what lots of uh, my colleagues are working on uh, which is you know what what the eu can do to help the situation in the korean peninsula you now we had uh, uh, we have uh, suggestions like um, you know accrediting an eu ambassador to to pyongyang and uh, uh, or you know nominating a special uh, envoy or special representative within the eas for, for the korean peninsula so i hope uh, some of these things will um, really take place. So to look at the the South Korean side of the peninsula, there's a few questions related to South Korea Japan relations. Um, where on one hand, because this is obviously also um, a tricky uh, tricky relationship, despite the fact that both uh, countries are are democracies and are allies of uh, the EU, and we have. Uh, uh, free trade agreements with, with both of them, uh, but the, the questions range from uh, uh, issue whether the Biden presidency could help uh, reconcile the uh, difficulties between uh, the two countries, or on the other hand, there's one question: uh, um, there is a fear that the Biden presidency uh, prefer a relationship with Japan over relationship with uh, South Korea. So, um, what do you think is the future of the, the South Korean Japan uh, relationship uh, during the next four years, let's say? Uh, difficult to predict, and I think that uh, the only ones that have an answer to that uh, are uh, sitting in Seoul and Tokyo, uh, I guess. Um, I, uh, you might think I'm naive, but I still believe a lot in the fact that uh, um, the real drivers of uh, bilateral relations uh, uh, are um, the two countries involved. And uh, uh, the intentions, sometimes the domestic politics, um, the public opinions, uh, um, movements uh, internally uh, on the two sides count a lot, um, sometimes much more than what another power in the world can uh, can influence uh, this is this is at least my my belief and my experience uh, i guess uh, that uh, uh, this administration will uh, try to uh, have uh, an approach that is similar to the one that the european union applies in this context which is that having strategic partnerships uh, both with korea and japan um, try to um, promote and encourage um, good uh, relations uh, and uh, uh, the overcoming of, uh, of disputes. Um, and maybe uh, on the US side, also offering some uh, uh, goodwill uh, support uh, to, to come to that. Uh, personally, I've always found it uh, very difficult uh, to, um, to navigate uh, through um, the the paradox of having, uh, yes, uh, a, a tension um, and, and problems uh, between two such good partners for the European Union. Um, and uh, I, I think the European Union, as the United States, are not in a position of taking any side, but to encourage uh, a bilateral solution of disputes. and. Uh, and the establishment of better relations as better as good as possible. Um, personally, I also believe that uh, uh, you know the the lack of uh, 
a regional cooperative framework uh, in, uh, uh, in, in Northeast Asia uh, is a problem uh, and is preventing um, further economic uh, and uh, safety and security cooperation uh, that would be much needed. Um, and um, I understand uh, all the reasons for the uh, disputes and, and the tensions, uh, but uh, I strongly believe that overcoming them would be extremely beneficial, uh, first and foremost, for Japan and Korea, uh, and obviously also for all their partners. Um, and possibly not solving these issues uh, is beneficial for those uh, that are um, yeah, benefiting from uh, divisions uh, around them, uh, take China maybe. So I believe that uh, really it could be wise, it could be smart, it could be in self-interest of both Korea and Japan to overcome, to find a way to overcome this, these difficulties. At least this has been always the message that we've tried to pass, and I guess the US will, will pass similar messages in the future. Okay. Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, we're also trying, uh, you know, in our at our level to contribute to this too. So maybe uh, since we are uh, sort of getting close to the end of this session, um, I'll ask you a last question, which which is quite on quite different topic. And of course, feel free to also add any 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 final words. And so the question is. Um, related to the role of women uh, um, in, in international politics because uh, uh, um, obviously you you were one of very few female uh, uh, not just high, high representatives but uh, i would say foreign ministers in general uh, now it seems that biden administration as you also pointed out is you know putting much more emphasis on diversity not just the uh, let's say ethnic uh, diversity but also having lots of women in the new administration. Uh, but yet, you know, this is work to be done, uh, certainly in, in Europe, um, but uh, in Asia, this is quite a difficult issue as well. Um, so, and also, you know, if I remember back my research, um, uh, when I was trying to uh, look at the, the nominations of EU ambassadors uh, that you made uh, in your previous capacity, I think you increased them from in, in terms of women from about 21, 22% to 25, 26%. So there's definitely, you know, a right movement forward, but it's not enough. Uh, so, uh, so this last question would be, you know, what do you think could be done about uh, this, uh, especially in, in uh, international politics? Um, yes, uh, I, I believe a lot uh, in uh, uh, introducing a gender uh, perspective uh, into foreign policy. Uh, we have promoted, when I was in office uh, in the European Union, um, uh, practice of uh, gathering the uh, women foreign ministers worldwide. Um, and uh, actually, we realized that we were quite many. Uh, and also of quite big uh, countries, or in the case of the European Union um, uh, organization. Um, and uh, uh, there are areas of the world where this is problematic. Uh, well, Japan for sure is one of them. I think uh, there's a lot of work there to be done there. But if I can share an anecdote uh, with you, um, uh, in the times of the Canadian presidency of the G7, and then afterwards when Japan took the G7 presidency, uh, the at the time uh, foreign minister of Japan uh, that is now covering another uh, another role in the cabinet um, was always taking part, even if a man, uh, to the women foreign ministers' meetings, um, declaring himself uh, to be a feminist, uh, which in Japan was quite a remarkable thing to do for a politician. Um, and, and, and on top of that, uh, um, uh, yes, uh, fr from a political family that is uh, not necessarily always investing a lot in. Um, in, in this, but um, uh, I think there are there is a cultural issue to be addressed, and that is uh, not specifically related to women in foreign policy, but it's related to the role of women in society and uh, institutions, uh, including academia, by the way. Um, because I, I'm now the rector of the College of Europe, but I realize that I am the first woman rector of the College of Europe, and the college has more than 70 years of history. So there is an issue in academia to be addressed, for sure. 
um, even if I see that in our panel today, we're all almost all women. So this is uh, uh, definitely there are some changes also there. But uh, I believe that there is a cultural issue to be addressed about the, the role of women in society uh, in many parts of the world. And there are progresses that need to be made also on, uh, in, on European or American uh, um, societies because it's work in progress. We're not, as you mentioned, we're not there yet. Uh, so we shouldn't have a paternalistic approach uh, in, towards countries where this is uh, uh, even less developed. Uh, and then there is a specific element of women in diplomacy, uh, because this is uh, still quite recent. Uh, if you imagine the language issue uh, is a very serious one. Um, you might know that in many diplomatic corps, um, now, in English, this doesn't work, but in French, which is traditionally the language of diplomacy, historically, I would say, the language of diplomacy, uh, you know that uh, uh, Madame l'ambassadrice, so uh, the, the female reference to ambassador, uh, was and sometimes still is officially uh, used not for the woman ambassador, but for the um, wife of the ambassador. Uh, and there is no specific uh, uh, feminine uh, name for women ambassadors. Um, and if you say, if you use the feminine uh, reference to ambassador, it's to indicate the spouse, the, uh, the, the wife of the ambassador. This signals to you uh, how much it is still um, uh, somehow rooted uh, in the diplomatic uh, uh, services worldwide uh, the uh, assumption that by default the ambassador is a man and has a wife. This has obviously changed a lot. Um, there are many women ambassadors, there are many uh, partners, uh, couples, same sex. Uh, so you, really the reference to the women ambassador doesn't make any sense at all, doesn't help you to get any insight on who is the ambassador and who is not. Uh, but there is a lot of, uh, of way to go. And indeed, uh, when I was uh, um, when I was a high representative, I tried to nominate as many women heads of uh, delegations, ambassadors as possible, uh, but was fighting uh, and struggling uh, with the fact that uh, uh, the number of candidatures uh, from women candidates was very limited. Why? Because uh, um, the candidatures to um, position of head of delegation of the European Union come from either EU officials or national diplomats. And if uh, and many diplomatic services in Europe now uh, try to increase the number of women uh, ambassadors mm -hmm. and so try to keep uh, the women diplomats in their national services and not send them uh, to Brussels because they need also to increase the number of women that represent their own countries abroad. And so not often we had uh, uh, not as often as we wanted, uh, we had candidates uh, from the states that were women. Uh, and that was uh, uh, an objective limitation to the choice, obviously. Uh, you cannot nominate someone that is not a candidate and not a good candidate because uh, uh, gender should never come uh, to replace uh, quality and, and merit-based, but should also come, always come uh, together with it. But um, I think that some positive steps have been uh, done. I think the trend is clear. And that is an increase of uh, the presence of women in uh, diplomacy everywhere. And I have seen personally, well, I see here in the college, uh, the number of uh, uh, students, uh, of uh, uh, women uh, students is higher than the number of men. Um, and in particular, international relations and diplomacy, uh, which makes me think that uh, we will have uh, uh, many of the new generations uh, that will be uh, much more gender balanced, I would say. Um, and I think that uh, uh, this also has a positive impact on, uh, um, on the quality of the diplomatic action worldwide, because, again, uh, I, I try to refrain from stereotypes and, and generalized approach, but I have noticed that uh, when you have more women sitting at the negotiating table, uh, you have, uh, let me put it this way, <laughs> you have a healthier management of ego uh, in the negotiations <laughs> themselves. <laughs> Uh, you have you tend to have a more focused approach on uh, long-term sustainable solutions rather than uh, an approach based on how do I get out of the room? Am I a loser or uh, am I a winner? Um, am I seeding too much? The focus that women take normally, again without generalizing, but I've noticed that there is a higher 
focus from women diplomats on the sustainability of the decisions taken rather than on the image that they themselves would get out of the result of the negotiation. Uh, and obviously this increases the quality of the outcome of the negotiations and all that. But again, I, I, I wouldn't like to generalize, but I've noticed the trend is, uh, um, is, is quite clearly this. So um, with that, I think uh, um, I, I don't have any other additional words to say, if not that I enjoyed the conversation a lot. I would like to thank all those that participated and also asked questions. I'm sorry if we didn't have time to answer them all, but maybe we'll have other opportunities to do so. And uh, again, I hope that this can be uh, a good uh, uh, also beginning for further cooperation uh, between uh, uh, the university, the center and uh, uh, the College of Europe. Well, thank you for uh, you know, the role of the, you see you're trying hard to in this balance in different direction than usually. Uh, of course, we will uh, we will be very happy to work for the rest of your uh, uh, slide gear. Thanks for taking uh, uh, hour and a half uh, of your time to, to talk to us. And um, uh, I will just now give a quick uh, final word to uh, Professor Lee, who will uh, also uh, say a few things. So thank you very much from my side. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Uh, Mogherini. And thank you, Teresa, and th thank you all of you for the great discussion. And it has been a great pleasure for me to have you, uh, Mrs. Mogherini, uh, at our Korea Europe Center. And I hope from my side too, hopefully we will have uh, be able to work together once again in the future. And also for our audience, Thank you so much for participating and for the uh, uh, great discussion. And we would appreciate if you can join to other events of our institute. And have a great day, everyone. And thank you and bye.